Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the School Board of Lashua County uh, Annual Elected Officials Meeting, February 28th, 2019. Um, and I, uh, we're now in order. Uh, first, I, I, with our big crowd on the dais here, I'd like to uh, 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 adopt the agenda. And uh, I, I think, uh, can we do that, uh, Mr. Delaney? Can we just do it by agreeing we're good? Or because I don't, I don't have any way. You know, no, no, no. You're good. Do we, do we need to do that or? I think that we put the public on notice of what the plan is today and the problem is sufficient. Right now, this group, you know, several more. Right. So. Three procedure procedures, probably it's going to be enough. Okay, thank you. I, I just don't think I have any authority to chair this group. Uh, I, I can, I'm sort of the, more, more the presider. Um, and so I, I'd like to. Uh, thank my uh, colleagues uh, from uh, both the city of Hawthorne uh, and the Alachua County Commission for being here. Uh, and first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce Vice Mayor from Hawthorne, Tommy Howard. Uh, and do, do we have any, Mr. Howard, do you have anyone you need to introduce in the no. audience? No. Okay. Uh, and our, our newest county commissioner, and uh, can I say a retired teacher uh, and ACA member, uh, a commissioner, uh, and not just that, one male, our teacher, uh, <laughs> Commissioner Mary Helen Wheeler. Uh, do you have anyone from the, uh, your, from the county you'd like to introduce? Not just see everybody that I know really well um, I'm Rob Hyatt, uh, Chair of Lodge County School Board. I do want to introduce my colleagues. Uh, we uh, There's one group here that has a quorum, uh, about a quorum. <laughs> and and uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Vice Chair Eileen Roy, uh, Board Member Tina Certain, Board Member Dr. Leonetta McNeely, Board Member uh, Dr. Gunnar Paulson, and also uh, welcome our superintendent, uh, Karen Clark. Uh, now, um, I'd like to welcome Suzanne Wen, who is uh, the director of community planning and con concurrency for the Elijah County Public Schools. Thank you, Chairman Hyatt. Good afternoon, elected officials and members of the audience. Welcome to the annual meeting of elected officials. This meeting is prescribed in our Alachua County Public Schools Interlocal Agreement and last convened on February 28, 2018. Since that time, the School Planning Advisory Committee worked through an eight-month process with many of your staff to provide recommendations to Superintendent Clark for our next elementary school site. Additionally, the Alachua County Public Schools sales tax referendum was passed by our voters on November 6, 2018. Mr. Gene Bowles with Building Livable Communities will be presenting the highlights of the 2019 annual report on school concurrency. You have this report in front of you and it may also be found on our school board facilities webpage. Additionally, we have distributed the proposed sales tax project list booklet that you also have in front of you and a summary sheet of the proposed project totals by jurisdiction. Your staff has been wonderful to work with. I've been with the school board now two weeks in July, uh, in two years in July, two weeks, <laughs> feels, feels like 10 years, <laughs> but in a good way. Uh, your staff, your interlocal staff working group uh, has been wonderful to work with and I look forward to working and collaborating with them in the future as the school board of Alachua County moves forward to create facilities that are equitable, modernized, and have sufficient capacity district-wide. We thank all of you for your attendance and participation today. I would like to introduce Assistant Superintendent White, who will be followed by Mr. Gene Bowles. Thank you, Suzanne. Mr. Chair, 
elected officials. I want, I want to talk a little bit about the opportunity that we collectively have here in Elytra County. Uh, in my discussions with the superintendent, we see this as a, as a watershed moment for this county. Uh, not only did the citizens support the Hebson sales tax, they supported Wild Spaces. The city and the county have come together to talk about allocating, I believe, somewhat, some, somewhere around $70 million to the east side of the county. If you look at this sheet here, it shows you that in the city of Elijah, we're investing $47 million. Mr. White, sorry to interrupt, but could you move the mic a little closer to you and speak up a little bit? Because um, I listen as hard as I can, and it's a little soft. Okay. Thank Sorry. You. That's it. I can project. Is that better? That's uh, okay. You're, you're, you can do a game show now. <laughs> so uh, we do have this watershed moment with the support that our citizens have shown us. So in in Alachua, for instance, we're investing forty-seven million dollars. In the city of Gainesville, it's one hundred ninety-one million dollars. Uh, in Alachua County, it's $132 million. In Archer, it's $7 million. Hawthorne, almost $12 million. High Springs, $10 million. And in Newberry, $32 million. Now, if we could think about, because we have a timeline to be able to do this, for us to be able to c collaborate and determine how we can leverage that investment. I don't know if that's infrastructure investments, park investments, whatever, but we do have the opportunity to leverage this. If, if a corporation was coming in investing this kind of money, we'd be jumping up and down and maybe offering incentives for them to do this, that, and the other. And what we're simply stating is that you know, cities are the core for many communities. But with the other dollars that have been allocated, we could really do something special here for all our citizens throughout the county. I want to turn it over now to, to Jean to go through the concurrency report. Good afternoon. Are you hearing me okay? I'm Gene Bowles. I'm a consultant to the school board on school concurrency. Uh, let me uh, echo what you uh, just heard and what you know uh, about where you were in 2019. Some very significant events occurred in 2019 that are only partially reflected in the report we'll be talking about. And what we, I, I want to move through this discussion fairly quickly. Be happy to answer any questions, but move to where we go from here, which is the exciting part of where you are. Uh, in 2019, uh, you went through a, uh, 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 as Suzanne referred to, an important process of selecting a site for a new elementary school, and very, very importantly, the sales tax initiative was successful. That will create a new landscape in which we go forward from here. What I want to talk to you about is where we are today in terms of where, uh, uh, but the, quickly get some discussion of uh, where we think we're, you're going uh, in the next few years. School concurrency, uh, this program essentially is uh, created through the, NLO, excuse me, the comprehensive plan amendments that each of you have, each of the local governments have in their, comp in their comprehensive plan, and an interlocal agreement which implements that. We are required each year to do an annual report, uh, and essentially we do that to an elected officials group, which is folks uh, that, that are here. The concept of school concurrency and school planning is to link community development, residential development, with schools, with the demand for schools. The, the business of school planning is much broader than that. It goes into a lot of issues of quality and, and uh, 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 community issues and so forth. What we're focused on, what we focus on in school concurrency is the, the link between enrollment and capacity, meaning the physical capacity of the school system to accommodate that growth. Uh, so uh, let me just simply clarify that that's the discussion that we're trying to have, and that's what we believe that the report you have 
shows you, gives you information and data about where we are in that relationship. Uh, we use a concept of capacity, we call program capacity, and the level of service is 100% of the program capacity. So in other words, when we're talking about uh, school demand, if we exceed 100% capacity of the school system, then we, have not, uh, we don't meet our level of service and uh, that's the, what triggers uh, certain actions under the uh, school concurrency program. But it's 100% of the program capacity for our elementary, middle, and high facilities. In order to determine the link between residential development and schools, we use a direct uh, measurement, our geographic information system, uh, we obtain from the county the address points in the, in the uh, uh, county, and we geocode the address points of students. And you see a couple of maps there, and what we do is, is lay these on top of each other to determine what the average student generation rate is for different types of housing. And we, we look at that in terms of single family and multifamily. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what those numbers are, each 100 units in single family uh, produce about 14 elementary students, six middle students, and eight high students. Multifamily, about nine elementary students, three middle, and three high. This is on average what that type of housing uh, produces. So the, the process of looking at school concurrency is one of matching uh, what's happening on the ground with that generation rate to determine uh, adequate uh, adequate facilities. Let me say that the, uh, the tools that we use for this process primarily grounded in the, the five-year district facilities plan in effect the capital improvement program for the school district that is prepared every year. Uh, it is adopted on October 1st and that in combination with what we call the COFTI projection, that's the capital outlay full-time equivalent developed by the Department of Education. They make projections, they do this for all the school districts in the state, uh, and these projections are, are, are updated each year, and it is those projections that we are required to use in terms to determine what the school demand would be related to development. Now the, uh, the, the charts that I will quickly show you here, and you, see you have them in the report, indicate the, those, the COFTI projection uh, in this case for total enrollment for last year and then the one we're using this year which is obviously the 2018. These will change from year to year and, and uh, but uh, uh, we hopefully they re represent some consistency uh, but wanted to show them to you so you could see uh, what we were projecting. I'm not going to get into specific numbers here unless you are interested but, all the, but uh, if the total school enrollment is in the neighborhood of 26,000 students, a little over that and you will see that uh, the, uh, this projection for, uh, for the next 10 years that was published this year uh, is slightly higher than the 2017 uh, uh, as we go through the 10-year uh, planning period. Now these, this is updated annually, as I say, and is the basis on which the five-year district facilities plan uh, is structured. Uh, if we look at high schools, again the same comparison, just breaking down the high school, we have about right at 7,000 students in the high uh, category. Again, the 2018 is uh, a bit higher, uh, higher projection than we had uh, last year. We look at enrollment in terms of concurrency service areas. These are not attendance zones, they are essentially areas where we, uh, that we believe are appropriate to evaluate the availability of capacity versus enrollment. In the case of high schools, you will see that they do coincide with the, with the, the high schools that are uh, in place in, this, in the elementary, you'll see a little different configuration. What th these numbers indicate is, is what is the relationship of enrollment to capacity and in relation to the level of service in the, these, the, high, the high school concurrency service area. When you look at the total, you will see that we have substantial uh, adequate capacity in high schools, totally about 75% of capacity is, is utilized, and that's expected to increase to about 84% in, in the five years and remain constant around that 84% number through the 10 years. You will see, though, that Buholtz has some issues with capacity and so forth. The, 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 the fact that we have it overall countywide doesn't mean that you don't have some uh, schools that are experiencing capacity or enrollment over the capacity that they have. So those don't justify new schools, 
but they may suggest operational changes in this kind of thing as, as they're evaluated. If we look at middle, again, you'll see the same similarity. The 2008 copy projection for middle is slightly higher than the 2017, 2018 is slightly higher than the 2017. There are about 6,200 middle students in the school system currently. Again, the same comparable table for the one I showed you a moment ago for the middle concurrency service areas. Again, looking at the total, we're about 82% capacity of middle capacity uh, of middle schools today, about 85% in five years and, and holding fairly steady throughout the 10-year period. There is overcapacity circumstances in Fort Clark and in Oakview uh, that, uh, again, uh, as I said, at certain schools you do have these issues and may involve operational changes to, map, to relocatable and other kinds of things to address these types of issues. Now we've always had the real capacity issues that we faced over the last number of years have been in the elementary uh, school area. Uh, this again is the chart. You will see that the projections for elementary is uh, relatively flat and, and essentially similar to for 2018-2017. The, the challenge has been that over the last several years we have been deficient or very close to utilizing all of our capacity in uh, the elementary schools and in the plant survey that was done two years ago the Department of Education did grant authority to build a new elementary school which you discussed earlier as the subject of the uh, school planning advisory committee of work last year. In the case of elementary uh, we have three concurrency service areas. We uh, two years ago consolidated these areas to make more sense from, from a concurrency standpoint. Uh, you will see on the map that we have a Gainesville East Alachua area which is Gainesville in the east part of the county, a northwest Alachua area which is High Springs and Alachua along with uh, and La Crosse, and then the southwest Alachua CSA uh, uh, which uh, is the uh, west urban area of the county, uh, Newberry uh, Archer. You will see from the data there that while overall we're at about 90 percent of capacity, the Southwest Alachua area, the growth area in the in the southwest part of the county, is presently at about 98 percent of its capacity, and that includes the calculations for the relocatables that are used and so forth. The construction of the new elementary school will change that picture, and you see that in five years, which consider includes the the, the consideration of that 948 student stations that are proposed there. It would be about 83 percent and remain uh, generally flat at that level through the 10th year. Each year the interlocal agreement and the comprehensive plans uh, require that local governments provide the school board the opportunity to review new development on in two different ways. One is called what we call plan review and that's where we look at comprehensive plan changes and rezoning changes that are being examined or, or approved by the local governments. That's essentially a letter that we send to the, uh, to the local government that says this is what the relationship is in terms of what this the new development that's being proposed or this zoning or this comprehensive plan change, uh, what would be its impact on schools and here's our estimate of that. The other review which is the regulatory portion, school concurrency is, regu is a regulatory concept that when development takes place there must be adequate capacity. That's what we call a concurrency review. And that actually occurs at the time the development or the developer is investing in the infrastructure. They're building the roads and streets for single family or in the case of multifamily, they're actually doing all of that as well as building the buildings themselves. Well, when we review that, that means there's an act in for concurrency, it's an active project. And what we would, we might call it's in the pipeline, so to speak. And that's the point in time we have to determine whether or not the capacity is, is there. The maps that I show you here give you some idea of the level of activity that took place, uh, uh, projects that are currently have that concurrency reviews and remain uh, in what we call a reserved uh, uh, circumstance. Uh, and they, they've been found to be adequate for capacity and they're tracking in a sense through the process. Uh, those homes are not in place now, or at least some of them might be already, but they, those are the ones that have been reviewed. Uh, and, and what we would, what I might call the, the, the pipeline in essence of residential development that will certainly begin to generate students within a short period of time, probably within two to three years. Uh, this is simply the uh, indication and you have in your report some detail on these projects, where they are, but this gives you an, an idea of, of where they're located. The, the map on the, the left is the city of Gainesville. 
Gainesville has a lot of development taking place. Most of it is multifamily, a lot of it around the university. Uh, the uh, map, map to the right is the Hill Plantation area, the West Urban uh, area. Uh, you see the interstate as the dominant feature there. These two maps, uh, the, the one on the uh, on the left is the uh, Tioga area, the area sort of central to the, uh, along Newberry Road, uh, and, and, and then the one to the right is the city of Alachua and the area surrounding that. And you get some idea again of the level of activity that's actively occurring and has been reviewed. And then finally, uh, the Newberry area in terms of their level of activity. Now all of that information, these maps, as well as the, the tables and so forth, are in your report if you uh, are interested in detail and so forth, um, uh, that's where you can, you can find that. All those together, the projects that are in that status as of the end of 2018, essentially two months ago, uh, are shown here. And again, the point I might make is that, as we know, a great deal of the development is occurring in the, the western area, the southwest part of the community. Uh, you will see that uh, Buholtz is uh, is the primary high school is uh, uh, where that development is taking place. Kanapaha uh, is uh, probably the leading middle school, and then of course the southwest Alachua area, uh, the, uh, a, a significant proportion of that growth. Uh, total uh, together, those all represent uh, about 426 potential students. If the averages play out, and they, in other words, we, we apply the, the multipliers to these homes as they're coming online. Those those homes do not exist today but they should exist within one to two years because they're, they are in the pipeline, as I've talked about, for development. Any questions about what I've uh, showed you here? Again, this is laid out in some detail in the report, uh, and, uh, but I'd be happy to try to answer any questions about uh, th this information that you might have. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Tina, board member Tina Certain. Uh, Mr. Bowles, I actually wanted to ask you a question. You said there were two ways that um, plans are reviewed, developmental plans. And what I heard the second way, the, uh, it seems like both ways, it seems like the plan um, developers have already started to spend a lot of money and they're putting in infrastructure. So what if it comes back and I know um, with reducing the number of concurrency zones from nine to three, it's like we're always being school, maintaining school concurrency. But what if there was a case of a comeback where there was not, we didn't have capacity, but the developers already started to spend money and put in infrastructure and things of that nature? How would the cost of that be recovered? Because what I'm afraid of is that growth would be happening and the school system be impacted and we're extending the system out and in a particular area and there's not enough cost to cover that and then we got to levy something on the whole county to accommodate that and, and subsidize growth in, over growth in an area. Let me try to answer that very good question. Uh, first of all, the plan reviews that we do, comprehensive plans and rezonings, do not necessarily mean that, in fact, they would not directly be resulting in infrastructure. Uh, they, they set the stage, in essence. Uh, the concurrency reviews are intended to prevent exactly the scenario that you just talked about. They occur before any investment has actually been made. And, and the, they typically, when that, those projects come in, let's say it's for a single family development, uh, there's a two-stage process. There is a preliminary review, uh, in which case the determination is made, is the, is the capacity present at the time? And uh, it, uh, if it is, it is, it, it is authorized. And they then have a period of a year to prepare their construction plans and come back with a final plan. When that final plan comes back, that then has, and that's approved, then uh, a finding that capacity is adequate. Then they have three years to complete the project uh, before they'd have to have a recertification or whatever. And that's the point in time they're actually expect they're expending dollars for roads and water and sewer and so forth. So they, the, the, the concurrency review, and this is true of all concurrency, whether it's roadways or, or anything else, occurs before that construction begins to prevent the very kind of problem that you're talking about. Now in the event there is not capacity, uh, we have something called proportionate share agreements. Uh, we don't have any that are technically proportionate share agreements that have come from a lack of capacity. Uh, we have one, what we call capacity enhancement agreement for Oakmont, which is where the Oakmont School came from. It was done a number of years ago in anticipation of concurrency issues down uh, the road. But uh, 
the whole intent of the program is to uh, authorize or determine that there's adequate capacity before those investments begin. Does that answer the question? It does. Yeah. Now, would you explain to me kind of briefly what capacity enhancement agreement is? Just well, to make sure I ask. Well, the capacity enhancement agreement was, uh, in that particular case, it, it's a voluntary uh, provision we have in the local agreement, which would allow a developer to, in effect, pay for his capacity. And in the case of Oakmont, they, they, they provide the site. And they got certain uh, uh, entitlements, if I want to use it, that may not be the correct term. Uh, as a result of that agreement. That was an agreement between Alachua County, the school board, and the developer. And it, it was primarily the dedication of the site, which uh, after a good deal of study was the site which was selected uh, for the new elementary school. So the donation of the land would that? Or some type of that, I, like that? The donation of land essentially uh, gave them elementary school concurrency for a thousand dwelling units. That was determined to be a roughly proportionate value of, uh, uh, that the land donation would have re would have um, represented. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Bowles before he continues? Okay, thank you. Oh, all right, let me now. Uh, so that essentially that's a very quick uh, uh, discussion of what's in the report and where we are. As I said. Uh, some very, very important things occurred this year, and they're going to set the stage for what's happening now and happening in this, this uh, upcoming uh, year, and I think we want to get to some discussion of that. You have a copy of the program list, and you've already had some discussion of that, uh, that was prepared to support and uh, answer questions related to the, uh, the, the sales tax initiative. Uh, also, the decision to uh, cite the new elementary school, which will have nine, a 948-seat capacity at the Oakmont site. This is now creating the framework and the, 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 in essence the content of what will, will be in the five-year district facilities plan to be adopted in October. We've given you a little bit of information in the report about uh, that was extracted from the, uh, the project list uh, that you have uh, and that uh, will be taking shape. Uh, oh, that, that's the real task now is for that to all take shape. Uh, in the next five-year district facility plan, facilities plan in terms of how your dollar, those dollars will start to be spent and the timing and so forth uh, of that. Uh, so let me uh, open it for discussion and I think certainly uh, you may have uh, uh, questions that are best answered by Ms. Wynn, Mr. White and so forth. But uh, uh, Well, uh, do I have a, I, I'd like to also introduce uh, Mr. Scott Jameson, Mayor of High Springs and um, does anyone on the dais have any um, any discussion, uh, Commissioner um, Wheeler? I, I have a question. Does redistricting enter, enter, enter into this at all in terms of these numbers, in terms of being able to juxtaposition students to schools? Does redistricting enter into this discussion at all? Uh, the, the current the current series areas are not attendance zones. Okay. They they are. Uh, uh, they have similarities, of course, but, but they are essentially designed to look at the capacity and enrollment question. Attendance zones themselves, the redistricting is a separate process. And uh, uh, obviously they, they have some relationship, but they're not uh, integrated. Uh, the, the, we, we look at enrollment and capacity uh, for concurrency purposes in terms of these larger uh, areas uh, as opposed to attendance zones. Uh, is there a reason to not to because as I'm looking at the school numbers and the anticipated rise and fall of right. students in there, uh, it seems to me that some of those kinds of things could be addressed by redistricting. Well, that, that, that's, that, that may be, that's certainly a possibility in terms of your, of how you, your operational changes, but it's not part of the concurrency process. It, it's a, a separate process of managing the enrollment in schools. So I do want to make the point that, that while there are obviously some inter, uh, uh, relationships here, these are uh, those, that's a different pro different process in the concurrency process. Okay, when you're when these new developments that are coming in here, do they address the need for bus stops and things like that, or who is going to be responsible then to make sure that? the roadways are safe and the 
that that our students who are trying to get to these schools, you know, are are safely there. Uh, bus stops are a big thing, I think, these days. That that's a review that the individual local governments do through the application of their development standards. Uh, the school our reviews do not involve the actual design, um, but but that is a the, that uh, that review uh, you'd need to speak to the individual local governments about exactly how they are reviewing that. But we do not do not review the actual layout uh, for that purpose. And I, I think from having been a participant with the City of Alachua Plan Board for a few years, it, it's been my experience, even though there haven't been more schools there, uh, if there's a new development, uh, these considerations are right. discussed and are part of, of whether or not that's approved or whether, uh, uh, whether or not changes are requested. So, uh, I, 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 again, that's my only experience there was City of Alachua, so, uh, but I, I, I haven't seen it in action. I think it's safe to say that the, the local governments generally have standards already in place within their own codes that would address uh, those very kind of, those kinds of issues. Well, I'm, I'm definitely new at this, for sure, but I am coming from uh, a profession of teachers and uh, school situations and concerns and it seems to me that if if the school board has any any leverage at all to make sure that the safety of these children is is foremost you know in these developers minds sometimes it's not that the school board should use that as should all of us in the local mm -hmm. communities make sure that the children are, are not uh, endangered by these developments or lack thereof of oversight of their safety. So I just feel like that if you're talking about concurrency has been an issue of mine for a long time, uh, mainly because of, uh, of the alarm of seeing so much development towards the West mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of our children that are not, you know, not being taken into consideration in other parts. Of, and also concern from voters who who uh, voted for this money to make sure that it's going to make to, to make sure that this list of um, repairs and and new buildings are actually are, are actually directed at the schools where we thought that money was going to. So I d just you know be aware that there are folks out there who will be watching very closely. I understand. Yes. And yeah, no, I'll, I'll uh, I know uh, Vice Mayor Howard, you had a. No, uh, it was resolved. I was okay. going to ask a question about capacity, but it... And, and I, I will say, as, as a little bit of, of response to uh, Commissioner uh, 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 Wheeler, I, if, if you... And I, I really appreciate um, this breakdown of where the monies are going to be spent. And if you do the math and... I can do some math. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's about. Um, we, I went to school before we had calculators. You know, but, <laughs> but, um, the new school. A little under six percent of the of the total expenditure of the tax money, and that would be assuming that all of the money came from the from the tax. The other projects currently, current schools, uh, will be receiving uh, a little bit over 94 percent. So if if there is a, uh, you know, people concerned about are we going to spend this where we say we're going to spend it, uh, that's been part of the process from the beginning, and I. I think um, I think it's important to remember that. No, it's not all about a new school, uh, but that was from the beginning part of what we were doing. So, uh, and I think six percent, I can live with that. Ninety-four percent for everything else, I can, everybody else, I can live with that. Um, Mr. Jameson, did you have any? I was I was curious on the numbers. Just I know High Springs is. Is growing quite rapidly. We're over 6,000. When I first moved, there was a 3,000. And so, 
you would only have, at what point in time, do you, do you, do you factor that in once the permits, I'm just curious from the timing of it, because we have several large developments that are basically out there, they haven't done it. At what point do they enter into the calculations when the, the plans are submitted, that means they're on, you, you follow what I'm trying to say? Yes. Because I'm looking, it looks like High Springs, you're, I'm seeing a lot of zeros on High Springs. Let me tell you what, we're, we're going to have an issue up there in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I have a little familiarity with High Springs because I uh, worked for the city back in the early 2000 area. Uh, High Springs planted a large number of units before the recession. That's where we review the concurrency. We've not seen new plats, at least submitted okay. to us. You are getting a lot of building permits, yes, uh, and that will show up. That that's not part of these concurrency numbers because it's essentially on uh, there. I I I don't want to use. Uh, well, I'm not going to throw out a, a a general number. There are a large number in the thousands of of residential lots in the county throughout the county that c can get a building permit without any review from the the, the school board, and High Springs is in. Uh, that's one of the circumstances, and now you may well start to see new development that would result in plants or multifamily come about, but we haven't seen those from you in the last. No, they're they're, years. they're fairly new, which they've come before us to where they're you know they're asking for annexation, and then and then the the, exactly. the land is being done. I'm just saying this is probably you'll do this again next year. I mean, I can right. see in four or five years where all of a sudden High Springs is. Cause, it I mean, could well be. I mean, it's just going. It, it, and, and the way we track that, of course, is by looking at actual enrollment in the, right. in the schools, but also wanting to, to understand what's happening in the, uh, in the local government in terms of the new development. Thank you. The other thing I'd like to add to that, Mr. Jamison, is we, we've been reaching out to your, your local and your local staff working group folks when there is the local and local people. <laughs> When, when there is a large development that's being planned, that... Stop, stop there for a second. Let me ask you, what's a large development? Give me a number. What kind of acreage would you say, Gene, it would be uh, worth pursuing a concurrency enhancement? Housing agreement? numbers. Is there a certain number of the housing that goes in that, that labels it as a large development, 100 homes? Well, for concurrency enhancement agreements, we generally were looking at projects that might be 1,000, 500, 1,000. Uh, they don't build all this at one time, but that, that generally starts to represent a potential for capacity enhancement. Okay. Okay. I, let me put, say, several years ago, there were actually uh, uh, several opportunities in High Springs to, for those kinds of agreements. They sort of uh, went by the wayside as yes. the recession came yes. to Correct. So we would like to know about those sooner rather than later so we can, we, Gene and I, can reach out to the developers and see if there's any interest there. Yeah, well, if you could get somebody from the city over there to communicate, we'd be all right. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know who that would be. I don't either. I don't need a comment from the audience. Sir. Well, I, I mean, it, it, in, it, when we first began the school concurrency work back in 2007, we had a much, st in fact, you say you have some information in the back of uh, that last section of your report that shows you what the projection was in 2007, which was much, much steeper. We were expecting to build six elementary schools within 10 years. We've got only one was actually constructed, now we have one other. Uh, one of those was in projected to be in High Springs uh, because of the, those projections at a time. Uh, so just to give you a little history there, that there has been, uh, High Springs wasn't, it, one point, uh, one of the areas that we expect uh, that to happen, that could well come back as as uh, your development taking place. Any further discussion? Um, well, I, I want to be sure that, that I, I, I've covered the material. I want to cover, but I want to be sure that the, the discussion may be more open to right. where the process is going from here, and that's right. really more in Suzanne's area. And, uh, okay, Ms. Lamb, did you want to, did you, or, or Assistant Superintendent White? Uh, Mr. Chair, in terms of transportation, um, there there is a, there are a layer of DOE requirements that that speak to the distance, which must be between stops and the distance within which we provide ridership. If you live less than two miles from the school, uh, that's deemed walking. Over two miles, we provide transportation. So, um, and then there are requirements, we have to designate what's called hazardous walking areas, so the expressway would be the biggest example of that. Um, 
children are not allowed to cross four lane roads, so no hopper, certain areas of that. So those regulations are in place. And so we always try to, to the extent possible, we try to pick up children on the side of the road they're standing on. Two lane roads, when the arms go out, traffic is supposed, is supposed to stop. That's an issue that we we uh, sometimes have to deal with, and law enforcement's been very uh, responsive when we've had instances like that in certain areas. I think we can, is there any more points, general points of discussion? Uh, I, I wanted to say that uh, I think to me, this is a, a celebratory moment, and that we have, thanks to the voters of Alachua County, that have uh, recognized that we need to move forward uh, with our infrastructure, and and this and this is, uh, I guess, in many ways, in spite of Tallahassee, uh, and. And I, I think the cooperation that we have as local uh, government uh, agencies uh, is, is very encouraging. Uh, an example would be with the city of Gainesville. Uh, we are, we're, we're getting a, a, a park, a playground park situation at J.J. Finley. Uh, I think that's close to being ready, uh, where the city is, uh, if, if, if Superintendent Clark, if you could help me if I, and make sure I say this correctly, come up if I don't, but um, is that the uh, school board is providing the land and the part of the, uh, a, a part of the campus there, and the city is putting in uh, what essentially is a new playground and a community park. And so that's a sort of cooperation that's a win-win. It's, it's, it's good for our kids that are going to J.J. Finley, and it's also good for those folks that live in the community. We have a, a, a project, uh, I, I think, that's coming up soon with, uh, with the, the land between Lincoln and Williams. Uh, and I think that'll be on our next agenda, so you can look at that. But but there's there are all kinds of chances if if we look at where the these uh, funds are are coming and when they are going to be. Whenever we get to uh, more of a schedule of knowing what's going to happen, it would be a, a chance for local communities to you know, pair up and and do things concurrently. Uh, with, with our project, so uh, I think it's uh, a, really a generational change here, a generational opportunity. Uh, and um, as as um, Assistant Superintendent White said earlier, uh, if we had uh, a, a company coming in here spending this money, we would be doing backflips. But this is. Uh, again, all thanks to the vision of the citizens of Alachua County for making this happen. Okay. So, do I have any other discussion, and then we'll go to uh, we'll get citizen input. If if not, uh, Ms. Wen, did you have anything else? Okay. Um, we'll we'll take uh, time now for citizen input and. Uh, uh, Three minutes is our general limit, but uh, we'll, we'll see uh, if what we can do is, is if we have, don't have, doesn't look like we have too many folks here today. Uh, any, uh, any member of the public like to uh, um, give input? Well, okay. Uh, in that case, any, any other comment? And uh, Commissioner Wheeler. I have a question, and, it, and, and it's not related to the concurrency right now, but while I've got folks here, I could ask the amount of money that is going to be required for our schools to be made safe. You know, that I don't know that has there been money coming in from Tallahassee that is going to cover those expenses, 
or do those expenses have to come out of this pot of money? <coughs> Mr. Chair, I, I think we're getting almost a million dollars for, for safety from the state, and no, that will not cover it. Uh, we do have a district-wide allocation of roughly uh, $5 million to address uh, security issues. I think we, we're fortunate here in Electoral County that we were ahead of the curve for a lot of a lot of jurisdictions in terms of having a public safety presence, which we expanded last year, the training we're doing with staff and students. So, uh, and then the other changes that are, that are planned, uh, we have that allocation. And in each design, we'll be looking at uh, how we can improve that. And that may be a challenge because I can remember when, when Wilds and Kanapaha were built, and there's little woods there. Back in those days, we thought it was really cool that the kids could walk through the woods to go to school. And now it's like, oh my God, they have to walk through the woods. So we'll, uh, all of our design professionals are very in tune with that. And so we'll, we'll be making those so changes. So between the physical and the technical and the actual police presence, uh, I think. So that's another one of those poorly funded mandates. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd say it's not only poorly funded, but it's uh, ever changing. Yes. Yes. And we had a, the Marjorie Summit Douglas Public Safety Act from, uh, from the 2018 legislative session. Uh, I'll say that was, a, that was a step in the right direction. So it, I, I don't want to, to say that uh, even though personally I didn't, it wouldn't be everything I would want from it. Uh, it's for Florida, in recent history, it's pretty historic. Uh, but the, as, as uh, Assistant Superintendent White said, uh, it doesn't cover uh, what they, the, the what, it doesn't. The funding doesn't cover what what they're requiring us to do, and uh, also we are in so much better shape than many of our uh, other school districts because we already had a good uh, cooperating uh, cooperation with the sheriff's department and uh, and the municipal police departments, mm -hmm. uh, and so. Um, but we're still going to have to face that on a, on a yearly basis, uh, and uh, I know and that's just around the corner this year. So. I, I know Alachua County's on it. I know we are on it. I just want to make sure that folks know that we're on it, and regardless of how much money they give us from Tallahassee, I know you folks are taking care of us. Okay, and, and if, if no other comments, we will adjourn. Thank you.